newness of life. We found that in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 4. We've been looking at uh, Romans 6, 7, and 8, which is the great passage on um, sanctification. It's a great passage on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, a lot of people talk about sanctification, and, and I, I, I fear they don't understand the, all that there is to understand about it. So today, hey, let me tell you something you need to do. If you're, if you're a visitor and you intend to hang around, what you should do is you should start a paper in the back of your book, your notebook, on terms, terminology, biblical terms. You should be familiar with biblical terms. I use a lot of terms, and I'm, I, I'm realizing in my conversation with, with people who haven't been under a theology school training, that they're not familiar with a lot of uh, typical biblical terms like harmatiology or, or sanctification. You should be familiar with these, and, and as we go through it, you need to, but there are a lot of doctrines. Like we've been studying positional sanctification. Now, this is a common basic theology principle, sanctification. Har, uh, har, hargig, hargig of amas. Well, you know, I'll get it out in a minute. It is the Greek word for, for sanctification. Hagiasmas is the word, hagiasmas. But what people don't understand it, they don't understand it, how it's, how it's divided in the Bible into the mechanics of your life. And so we've been studying, I introduced you to positional sanctification in uh, Romans, the sixth chapter. So I think it's on your paper. So let me, let me take a look at it, because here's sanctification. There are, three, there are three classifications of sanctification. There are three classifications. And it's important that you know these three sanctificational ideas. Good people talk about sanctification. They, you know, pastors say sanctified, and they probably know what all this means, but they don't explain it enough so that people are kind of confused about what sanctification is. So the best way for me to explain it is how Paul uses it. When he uses it, you got to be familiar with what he's talking about. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 16, in 2 Peter 3, 16, Peter says, when you study Paul's writings, you got to have your thinking cap on. That's my terms for it. You've got to really pay attention when you study Paul, 2 Peter 3, 16, he says, you gotta, you got to really have your thinking cap on. So one of the things that you, if, if you're interested in studying with us, one of the things you ought to do is you ought to begin a, a doctrinal term page. You know, if you study any course, like if you go to college and study a course that so you take psychology, there's a whole list of terms you have to learn. If you take if you take math, there's terms you have to know. Biology, there's terms you have to know. And most in any field of, of things, there, there are terms you have to know. Agreed? I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. There's terms. If you get a computer, there are terms you need to know. It's true with the Bible. There are certain terms, theological terms, you need to be familiar with. And when you see them, you know what that means. Let me give you an example. There are three classifications of positional sanctification. Of sanctification is, has, has three divisions or, or three classifications. In Romans, the sixth chapter, it's on your paper, third, third uh, paragraph down. He, Paul writes, and he opens up the sixth chapter this way, and then he, he really rolls on it. I mean, he really gets heavy. He, he introduces you to this idea in chapter six. He pounds it in chapter 7, and then he just brings great enlightenment to it in chapter 8. Romans 6, 7, and 8 are dynamite for the Christian life. Well, here's what he says. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, notice the CPT on your paper? Now, we have done weeks of study on this. 
But that's current positional truth. That's current positional truth. That's current positional truth of sanctification. And anytime you see this phrase in Paul's writing that you're in Christ Jesus, he's dealing with a, method, a classification of sanctification that, for, for example, be sure you pick up a little pamphlet on your way out called 50 Things that you receive in salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. Be sure you pick that little pamphlet up. Uh, yeah, there, there's one of it. It's absolutely free. Just pick it up and study that. It's really important you study that because it, it, it's going to tell that. Now, current positional truth is who you are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Uh, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. What does that mean? See, what does that mean? Wouldn't you like to know what that means? Well, here's what it means. It means current positional truth or current positional truth of sanctification. It's a division of that study. In that little pamphlet, it says that you receive 20 status privileges. That's in Christ. And everything that he is, you become. He's a son, you're a son. He's an heir, you're an heir. He's a priest, you're a priest. He's eternal life, you are eternal life. That list goes on. That's who you are in Christ. That's called, that's called current positional truth. And when you see that phrase, and Paul uses it a lot, Paul uses this phrase in Christ 164 times. And that's what he's talking about. It's exactly what he's talking about. And he uses it a lot. Paul does. I mean, Paul is where you get the great theology of the new covenant. You know, we're not under the law of Moses. You know that we're under the law of Christ. <laughs> well, do you take part in the Eucharist? The Lord's Supper, communion? Do you do that? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, it says, when you lift the cup, it says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. He's talking about the blood of Christ. What, is that? what does all of that mean? It should have great meaning to your life. And so here, Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ at the point of salvation... When you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, Paul calls that the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. When you believe it, according to Romans 1, 16, you receive. Believe and receive. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself is a gift of God. Not of yourself it is a gift of God. Okay? The moment you believe the gospel... Paul teaches that you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. You are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. My, my, write this down. My, my, my. If you got a piece of paper, listen, there's a pencil. If you haven't got one, there's, we give you pencils. I don't give you money, but I give you a pencil for coming to church. Now, you ought to write down Galatians. Write down Galatians 3.27. You ought to write down Galatians 3.27. You ought to write down 1 Corinthians 12.13. Because you're told that you are baptized into Christ, and when you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his body, the church. Those two verses. That's positional sanctification. So Paul... Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, that's current positional truth, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, when you see that, you're talking about positional sanctification that's based on your salvation. Okay? And what comes with it? He's going to tell you that you should clothe yourself with the new man. And he's going to tell you what those clothes are in your closet. You're a son. You're adopted. You're all these things in Christ. 
pick up that little pamphlet on your way out and study this. You know why God gave you the Holy Spirit? One reason is John 14, 26. That when the Holy Spirit would come and dwell inside the human body, based on the salvation message that he believes, the Holy Spirit would take up residence inside your body, and your body would become the temple of God. A mobile church. And it says the Holy Spirit, write this down, John 14, 26, says the Holy Spirit would teach and recall the Word of God. The Holy Spirit has been sent to your life to teach you the Word of God and to recall it. And He lives in you, John 14, 16, write that down. John 14, 16, when He comes and indwell, indwells you, He's there forever, forever, forever. Jesus said that in John 14, 16 at the Last Supper. And when the Holy Spirit comes, He will indwell you forever. He's not going to be there one day and go on the next. He's not going to be there one day when, when you're singing praises and the next day you're whining and moaning and groaning and complaining that you don't know why you ever got saved and where is God and what's He ever done for me? Still there. The Holy Spirit's still there. Listen to all that whiny, whiny stuff. He's still there. He ain't going anywhere. Can't. He's not permitted. Once he enters, he's not permitted to leave until the whole deal's over. We live in the dispensation when the Holy Spirit indwells every church age believer. It's the dynamics of the Christian life. The third member of the Godhead lives inside your body when you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. He lives inside your mortal body. The third member of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, God the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, lives inside of your human body. Paul called it your mortal body, meaning you get it at birth and you have it till death. He sometimes refers to it as the flesh. Sometimes as a mortal. Mortal. Well, Here's what, Paul wrote. Here's what Paul wrote. This is a review. This is what Paul wrote in Romans 6, 3 and 4. Do you not know all of you have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death? Baptized into his death is called retroactive positional truth. Because Jesus died, listen to me, here's retroactive positional truth. I've never heard of that. Well, what can I say? I don't know. I don't know why you never heard it. You're hearing it now. After today, when somebody says, do you not know? You're accountable for do you not know. You're not accountable for what you don't know, but you are accountable for what you do know. Paul said, do you not know? Meaning, are you, you're accountable for what you do know. Hmm? <laughs> well, if you said to somebody, why don't you know? And they go like, well, you never told me, right? Is that the next answer? If you didn't know. So he, that's what he's talking about with that. Retroactive business truth, here's what it is. Christ died in 30 AD on a hill called Golgotha along with two other criminals, right? Under the Roman law and Israel. Retroactive business of truth, only the guy who was raised from the dead is the Savior. Because all three guys died under, under the rule of law called insurrection. Pilate says, I can't hold this man Jesus to that, to that law of insurrection because he's certainly not guilty of it. So I'll give you Barabbas. Do you want Barabbas, the leader, or do you want Jesus, the leader, who never led an insurrection ever in his ministry that we can find? They chose Barabbas. And Jesus hung on the cross. He didn't hang there for insurrection. He hung there for the sins of humanity. He died there for you and me. 
In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's, that's quite an exchange. That's quite an exchange, my dear hearts. He took your hell so you could have his heaven. That's quite an exchange. We better stop and have a word of prayer. <laughs> My introduction is getting too long. Here's the issue. If you're a believer, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You don't ask him to come in. He, he, he comes in because you believe the gospel. He does eight works. The Holy Spirit does eight works at the point of salvation that you can never lose in time and eternity. One of them is to dwell, indwell your mortal body. And he's, John 14, 16, he's not permitted to leave. That's what the word forever means. Don't you like the word forever? You do when you face in death. <laughs> Forever is a big word. may not be a forever a big word here when you're thinking about what you got to do today and tomorrow, but it's a pretty big word. When you can have a word forever given to you by God and your feet are still on earth, that's a big deal. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's there to teach you the word of God in assembly such as this. Bible study. That's what we're doing. We're, do we're doing Bible study. So, listen, here's what's going to hinder the Holy Spirit teaching and recall. Personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins, but these sins cause you to be carnal. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, you're, going to, you're carnal. You're fleshly. You've went to the lust of the flesh rather than to the lust of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. How do I get back? How do I come out of carnality and back to spirituality? I've got to confess my sin. Isn't that wonderful? You know what confession of sin does? It takes you back to the cross. Listen to me now. This is important. It takes you back to the cross. Not for salvation. That's a done deal. For sanctification. So that you can be restored into the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit that lives in your body and not permitted to leave. It could be mental attitude types of sins, sins of the tongue, or verse sins, but they got to be confessed before. You study the Word of God. If you study it under the ministry of the Spirit, He promises that He will teach and recall John 14, 26. Okay? So this is our word of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, allow you priesthood. You're a believer priest. One of the status privileges of in Christ is that you're a priest after the order of Jesus Christ. Not, not, not Levi, but Jesus Christ. And so, our Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the power of 1 John 1, 9 in my life to remove me from carnality of the flesh back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me. We are promised in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sin, the work of Christ is extended to the Christian life for sanctification, to restore us into the great ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. In the teaching hour, it's, it's, it's very important for us that we might learn the Word of God and find clarity with it, to place it within our soul as a tool to equip us to be victorious in the angelic conflict, to not be a victim, but to be a victor. Do that for us today, Father, in the name of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, let's finish our review of Romans 6, 3, and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, current positional truth, into Christ, have been baptized into his death? Retroactive positional truth. He died in 30 AD, uh, 30 AD, whenever you got saved, whenever you got saved, whatever year that was, let's say it's 2000, the work he did in 30 AD works for you in the year 2000, right? He got saved. 
How about that? That's called retroactive positional truth. And you know why that's important? Because every, every human being is under Adam's sin and 13 judicial charges. Alienated, blind, cursed, condemned, at enmity, death, darkness. You're a natural man, not a spiritual man. You're a, a sinner. You're unrighteous, you're ungodly, and you're under the wrath of God. Pick up that little pamphlet. It's all documented for you. The moment you believe, those 13 judicial charges that separate you, judicially separate you from God, for him to have a relationship with you, a sinner, that whole deal, alienate, that whole list is done away with because of the work of Christ on the cross. Now he's buried and raised from the dead, and you get current positional truth. Everything that he is, you become in time. And you get experiential positional truth is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. What a deal. And you got it all by grace. Saved by grace and not of myself, it is a gift from God. Whew. You ought to be happy. Back to Romans 6, 3, and 4. Therefore, based on what we've just learned, word therefore, always ask yourself, why for is therefore? Because therefore is always used to tell you, I'm going to bring a conclusion what I just told you. Anytime you see the word therefore, ask why for. And you have to study a little bit. Okay? you got to research a little bit. Therefore, we have been buried with him. We have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, watch this now, so we too, circle the word too, very few people use it correctly. I was thrilled to death. I got a text from my high school grandson who used it correctly. And I went, cha-ching! I was so excited because, my, my, what's going on today in our public education? He actually used it correctly. Very few people write it correctly. If they do, they've probably had, they've been coached on it somewhere. Do you know what that, when you have a double O, you know, a double aught, seven? You, you know that, don't you? You know when you have that double O, you look in there to see who it's being compared to. Watch this now, because you missed the T-O-O. Watch this, therefore we have been buried with him, that's capital H, Christ, through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too. Now watch what he's going to do. He's going to compare Christ dying and being raised from the dead. Watch this now. To walk in newness of life. Christ comes out of the grave to walk in the power of the newness of life. How about that? And we have that power to walk in the power of in the newness of life indwelling in us. Tell you one thing, you make me earn every penny I get. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Write this down. Because you don't, you don't realize this, that how important the statement is. This is Romans 8, 9 through 11. Romans 8, 9 through 11. Listen to this. And that's all right. Look, look, I got nothing else to do but teach you. I'm not going anywhere unless the Lord calls. <clears throat> Romans 8. Listen to this. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, he does if you believe the gospel. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not belong to him. The moment you believe the gospel, you get the Holy Spirit indwelling you. 
now you belong to Christ. If Christ is in you, and he is if you believe the gospel, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Watch verse 11. Watch verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and, and listen, that's a first-class condition in the Greek language means, and this is true, if it's true in the protasis, it's true in the apotasis. If it's true in the, in the if, it's true in the then in the Greek language. This is a first-class condition. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, if you believe the gospel, then he who raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, will also give life, that spiritual life, that's divine life, that's the life of God in you, will also give life, because you already have human life, this is divine life, this is called eternal life, this is the life of God in you, because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. My, my, my. Well, here we go. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It couldn't be clearer than that. What we call that is experiential positional truth. We have three classifications of sanctification. Retroactive positional truth identified with Christ on the cross. Current positional truth, identified with Christ, seated at the right hand of God the Father, everything that he is, we become. Experiential positional truth of sanctification is the Holy Spirit dwells in us and the great ministry of God flows from us because our body is the temple of God, the naos. That word in the Greek language of 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what, don't you know that your body is the temple of God? That your body is not your own anymore? That your body was bought with the price of Calvary or Golgotha or the work of Christ on the cross? Don't you know that? See, Paul says, don't you know that? He says that because he has taught him that. And why don't you understand that or believe that? I've taught you that when he says, or do you not know? He's not saying you don't know. He's saying, well, how is it possible that you don't get that? Now we're in Rome. We're in Romans, the sixth chapter. I'll tell you what you better do now. I'm just going to help you out. Get you a blank sheet of paper, put up doctrinal terms, and start writing doctrinal terms that you're learning. Just like you had to do when you took math or any place else, you got to learn terms. Paul's full of them. I mean, I ain't making up any of this stuff. This is this biblical stuff. Well, here we are in the sixth chapter, verse 12. I want you to, I'm, 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 we're going 12 through 18, and then I'm going to pull in 22 to you in this, out of the six. I've already done the first 14 verses. Last week we did the four, first 14 verses of chapter 6. So I'm going back to 12 because I have the word therefore. All right? I have the word therefore. And I'm going to read it to you. That, let's see, 612. Therefore, do not let us it. You know, if you got therefore, you've got to ask yourself therefore, why therefore is therefore there. So you're going to have to go back and read chapter 6. I know. You know, I, I just thought church was just someplace you went and slept and sang a couple songs, slept and went home. Not here. You got to study. Therefore, do not let sin reign. That's your sin nature. That's your sin nature. Do, you better, better know that. Do, therefore, do not let sin reign. Be master over you. Do not let your sin nature reign in your mortal body. Where, where does this sin reign? 
inside your mortal body, your flesh. It's your sin nature. You got it with Adam's sin. That was a package deal. Adam's sin and the sin nature. My, my. Genesis 2.17. Genesis 2.17. God told Adam, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat, here's what he said in Hebrew, dying you will die. Two deaths. Dying you will die. He used the Hebrew word muth, M-U-T-H. He said dying you will die. I, I, listen, when I get to the book of Genesis, and I'm going to be there in a month or two, it just depends on how well we're doing here. I'm going to get you familiar with terms. I'm going to teach you all this stuff. And the Hebrew of it is just dynamic. Muth, muth. This is the Hebrew word for death. Dying you will die. And Adam ate of the tree, and he died spiritually, separated from God. He started hiding from God, covering himself up. God had to call him out. Kills an animal, uses the blood sacrificially to represent Christ, and gets saved. 950 years later, he died physically. Until he ate of the tree, he was never going to have either of those experiences. <laughs> he said to Adam, you can eat of all the trees in the garden, but not that one. That one in the middle right there? That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That tree you're not permitted to eat from. But in the day you eat of it, dying you will die. When Jesus hung on the cross, he died two deaths. <laughs> I know. Write this down. It's a proof text for you. John 19, 30 and 31. While Jesus is on the cross. John 19, 30 and 31. Listen, all I'm teaching you today is milk. You know, Hebrews 5, 13 and 14, milk and meat. This is not meat. This is milk. I'm just saying to you that if you want to grow, you've got to become a student of the word. You know why? Listen to me. Write this down. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You're not going to get faith any other way. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, you're commanded to walk by faith and not by sight. You're commanded. It's a present imperative. You start the Christian life as a baby in regard to the Word of God. He starts you on the mother's milk, and then he moves you to, to a bottle, and then he moves you to meat, solid foods. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, 13 and 14. Well, anyhow, therefore do not let, watch, these, watch the word in, in 12, do not let sin, that sin nature, reign, in your mortal body, speaking to believers. Watch this. So that you obey its lust. The lust that's involved with the sin nature is attached to the flesh of the mortal body, and you become the subject of it. You are the subject of it. And you're told, in the imperative mood, not to let it rain. R-E-I-G-N. Let me read it again. Because you just miss stuff. You, it's okay, but you miss stuff. Therefore, you do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. When you obey its lust, 
for gratification, it's a personal sin. Write this down. James 1, 14 and 15. Shows you the mechanics of how lust in the flesh becomes sin in your life. How lust in your flesh becomes sin in your life is described in James. James 1, 13, 14, 15 in that neighborhood. Do not let, and that's, a, that's a, an imperative, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. This is also discovered in Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. The mortal body. Lust of the mortal body. Do not go on presenting. There's another idea. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as a life from the dead. How do I do that? By walking in the spirit. Don't walk in the flesh, walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. And when you do that, you are now fulfilling experiential positional truth of sanctification. That is the mechanics of sanctification in the Christian life. As those alive from the dead, as your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. The sin nature should not be a master over you. That's the word Lord. With a little L. The word master is the, in the Greek is the word for Lord. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Then in verse 15, he goes, What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace, may it never be. That's personal sin. Shall we give in to the sin nature and the lust to have temporal pleasure rather than to stay with the ministry in God, have permanent pleasure with God in time and eternity? It, meaning that when you walk in the power of the Spirit, you, you get the rewards of it. Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Doesn't say fruits, says fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. See, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. There is much more than that. That's just inner, internal things. When your life is in an uproar, you can go to the indwelling Holy Spirit and he will produce love where love could never be there in your flesh. What you want to do is run over him with a semi-truck. The last thing that you want to give them, you want to give them a pound of flesh. You don't want to give them love. But what is needed in that is love. And then you're all torn up and you can't sleep and what you need is peace. And you have it right there. All you have to do is go to the Holy Spirit and he will produce peace that passes all understanding. And this list goes on. Why would you go there? Why would you go to the medicine cabinet and pick a couple pills up, take them so that you could sleep, when you could go to the Holy Spirit and he'd put you to sleep with a good attitude? My, my, my. The, the Christian is beyond worldliness. Well, anyhow. Sin should not be your master over you, for you are not under the law. But what, what, what then? <laughs> Paul, Paul is, he says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present your someone, yourself to someone as a slave for obedience, you are a slave to the one to whom you obey? Girls, you ought to be careful of that before you get married either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. I love this line. You can see that word, thanks? That's chorus. Rick, there's your word. Grace. But thanks be to God that th though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. That is the gospel of Christ. 
and having been freed from sin, that takes in all three categories. That takes Adam's sin, sin nature, and individual sin. Three categories of harmatiology. The three divisions of harmatiology, the study of sin, is imputed sin, inherent sin, and individual sin. Now, we've studied this in great detail, and, and listen, look, look, look. Can I encourage you to come back? <laughs> Spend one year with me. You can't get in a lesson. You can go anywhere and get a lesson. But if you want to get Romans 12, 2, and you should want it. If you want to get Romans 12, 2, give me one year. Pick out a day. I teach on Tuesday for lunch. We'll feed you lunch, and you eat, and I preach. Either come with me and stay with me a year. Pick out a day. For me, it's Tuesday or Sunday. Stay with me one year. And you will see the power of Romans 12 too. Did you write that down? Well, how come you didn't write that down? You should want that. You should really want that. Well, okay. I, I can feed you a little bit. I can feed you. Starts with verse 1. Listen to this. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living, holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. See, you think you've come to worship? Not unless you fulfill that verse. You can come to church, but you may not worship. See, he set a standard pretty high for worship. I'm just saying. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You need to get into transformational thinking by the renewing of your mind to the teaching of the new covenant. Boy, you need to get that. And it will transform your life. If, but listen, he says there's a technique that has to be done. You've got to renew your mind. You've got to, you've got to learn this stuff and apply it to your life. If you, go, if you go to college, you take a course, you have to learn all the terms they give you, test on it, test on it, test on it, then you pass, and you go like, oh, wow. And you can take 200 in that course. They don't have to give you all the vocabulary because they already gave it to you, and they passed. They said, you're worthy now to take 200 because you know the vocabulary. Well, anyhow. Did you notice that 12, 13, and 14 go together? And did you notice that 15, 16, 17, and 18 go together? Well, let me show you how they go together. 12, 13, and 14 go together because it says, therefore, do not let, in verse 13, do not go on presenting. Let me show you something about it. In verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body is a present active imperative. See the P, that's present tense. A is active voice. IMPV is an imperative, that's a command. A present imperative is a standing command. This command always holds true for your life. Second person plural. Uh, it's a thir third, third person singular, and it means to stop. Therefore, do not let stop. If you're doing it, stop. If you haven't do it, done it, then don't. It's either stop or don't. Therefore, do not let. Then in verse 13, it says, do not go on presenting. Parahistomy is a present active imperative, second person plural. That's a command. That's a standing command in the Greek language. He's given you two commands. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey its lust. That's the Galatians 5, 16, 17. Then he gives a command. Do not go on presenting the members, the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. And he comes back with an aorist active imperative Another command, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead, as your members, as and your members, parts of your body, as instruments of righteousness of God. In verse 14, the word for is a conclusion. For 
sin, old sin nature, shall not be master, reign master, reign. See, reign is where he sits on the throne, right? Well, yeah, the reign sits on a throne, king sits on a throne. And then down here, master is the Lord, who he is that sits on the throne. You don't let your flesh sit on the throne of your life. It produces sin. You don't let your sin nature, your flesh, sit on the throne. You let the Holy Spirit sit on it of your life. For the sin nature should not be master, future active indicative, Lord over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. In verse 15, 16, and 17, 18, this is what he says. What then? And then in verse 16, do you not know? Verse 17, 18, we ought to be thankful for the grace of God. Here's what he says. In verse 15, what then? Shall we sin personal sin? How do we get rid of it? 1 John 1, 9. You know what personal sin is? It's evidence of who's sitting on the throne of your life. Personal sin is the evidence that the flesh is master of your life because you're choosing to sin. It's a choice you make. Well, I'm going to be mad, and I'm going to be mad all day, so you can just forget about it. Or, I'm mad, I'm going to be mad all night, so you have a choice. You can sleep on the couch, or I will, when both of us not sleeping in that bed. Am I getting too personal? Getting too personal? Listen. Depends on who's reigning. The flesh reigns, it wants its way. When the flesh reigns, it self selfishness reigns. How do I get them off? I confess that. I confess that to I confess that as sin to God and look for the Holy Spirit and depend on the Holy Spirit to give me the joy and all of the things that's necessary. Listen, you can be quiet and walk away and still be hurt. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't fight. Yeah, but you wanted to, and you, yeah. What did I do? I surrendered. There is none of that. A surrender is a victim. You should always want to be a victor. When the Holy Spirit is on top of his game in your life and you're joyful of that, you're a victor, not a victim. Way too many Christians are living victim lives, and they ought to be living victor lives. And it's all about getting clued in to how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there, and he wants to be the master. One of them is the master at all times. You're sitting there today, somebody... There's only two ways this thing to go. Either the old sin nature is sitting on the throne or the Holy Spirit that indwells me is. It's never vacant. One or the other is sitting on it. It's never vacant. Because you're a mortal body. which is not your own anymore. God purchased it at Calvary so that he could bring your mortal body back into the plan of God where the dynamics of the ministry of God could work in your life. If you're in the eighth grade and you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, you can be a mobile church in your school. Because you carry the Holy Spirit in your body. And listen, you don't have to play the, be a big game person. Eh? You just let the Holy Spirit live through your life, the life of Christ, and your life will have great influence upon people. All he wants is an opportunity to work from the throne of your life with permission from you. I want you in my life. I want you sitting on the throne of my life. 
you're never too old and never too young to see the power of God work out of your life and touch people in your class, teachers and principals, coaches, and other, other people, other parents. Let the Holy Spirit live in the power position of your life. You were told to let him reign. Let him be the one who presents out of your life the things of God. You don't have to sit around and say, well, I'm supposed to love him, I'm supposed to love him. So unless you go to the Holy Spirit and love him. You'll love him in a way, it will live in, uh, love him in a way that he wouldn't be dependent on you for that love again. Parents ought to love their children that way so that they become dependent on God for that love rather than themselves. You not understand that. The greatest gift you can give your children is God, who is a vital force in their life. They can go to school and have a great ministry. I've seen kids in the fourth grade, and the fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, into the high school arena, into the college level, have just dynamic ministry. They've just relaxed, have learned to let the Holy Spirit. It's a choice you make. It's a choice. Your life is always about choices. Choose to let the Holy Spirit sit on the throne of your life at all times. Watch this now. The two words I want you to really focus on. Therefore, just as through one man, that's Adam. Verse 14 tells you that's Adam. Therefore, just as through one man, sin. That's Adam's original sin. That one man is Adam, and that sin is Adam's original sin. Just as through one man, sin entered, there's a key word. That's a key word. Uh, Terry, this is a big word for you. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread, that's the other key word, to all men, because all have sinned in Adam. Adam's original sin that every human race is under because it, it, it has entered and spread to the whole human race. Hey, listen, can I tell you something? You know there's only one race. There's only one. It's the human race. All this other stuff is just a, a ploy from the devil to distract us from what it's all about. All this stuff, we're so caught up with foolishness today, it just upsets me to no end. Well, I hope there's an end, because... Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious and it's like There's only one human race. All this other race stuff is a ploy from the devil to distract us from the real message. Jeez. Well, I know you know that. So, where was I? Five, I was in 512. Look at the word entered and spread. Just as through one man sin entered into the world, that's human beings, and death through sin. See, we know the world he's referring to Here's the world. Here's the world he's talking about. John 3, 16. Are you, are you saying it to yourself? I know you don't, John 3, 16. For God so what? They did what? Why? Then it perish, but have everlasting life. This is the word world. Hmm? 
Watch this now. The word entered and spread. The ever member of the human race, and there's only one, is it's of the world. The world is one race. It's called the human race. Right? And everybody born into the human race is born under Adam's sin. It has entered and spread. That's DNA stuff. Or another thing we haven't come up with to say the same thing. I mean, right now, the term that is best used for that is like DNA. That's part of your DNA. I don't know that's a correct term to use here, but the idea is there. It has entered the human race, and it has spread among the human race. I think I put it on. Did I give you that? Well, anyhow. See, I gave you the Hebrew words. Watch the, I mean, the Greek words. See the word entered up there under point one? See, it's got, the, it's got ice, air cold by. See the E-I-S? That's into. Ice is a preposition with a verb. And the air is active indicative. And then the word, the death spread. The sin entered and the death spread. Sin entered. Adam's original sin entered. And as a result, spiritual death spread. Spread. And he used the word dia. Now, you, it's D-I-A, but they drop the A because the next word is an E. Dikomai. And that's, it's spread, or maybe your Bible says it was passed on, or passed down. It's, we, we, listen, when I first heard this in theology, they said this was, and, and I still believe it, they're probably their best word for this is gene, genealogy, um, genetics. They use, the, my professor, says, what we're talking about is genetics. Now we've got it down into a DNA deal. So I don't know, Terry, exactly where this would be, but it would certainly be genetic of the human race, of every race down the pike. There's, and today people, uh, I have friends that, Refer to it when I was because they said probably Bill. Bill, that was probably true with you too. Going through school, Morgan. They they said this was genetic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but they probably they probably got that even a close up. I don't know how you ever figure that out genetically. But what do I know? I don't know anything about genetics. I know a little bit about the Bible, and that's about it. Um, look at verse uh, thirteen. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. See, so that's that Romans 3 issue. Uh, but it's, it's there. For In verse 19, For as through the one man's Adam's disobedience to many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. So what a wonderful concept that was. Okay? So my point is this, that every member of the, according to Paul, every member of the human race, world, Adam's sin enters it, enters, enters the human race, and it is passed on down the pike. One exception in the theology of this idea, Jesus Christ, who was born outside Adam's sin, because God was his father. Agreed? Well, Luke, well, you need to read Luke 1, 31 through 35 and put it on your paper. He's the only exception. Virgin conception, right? Conceived of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, here we go. Point number two. The old sin, the old sin nature resides in the mortal body of every member of the human race with the exception of Jesus Christ, born outside Adam's sin, the fact that he wasn't under Adam's sin means that he didn't have a sin nature because what is passed down, what enters is, the old, is Adam's original sin and what's passed down is this idea as well as the old sin nature. You get it at birth and you have it till death. 
it enters and is passed on. Physical birth to physical death. Physical birth to physical death. All right. All right. So I covered that. I gave you a lot of scriptures well worth your read, especially these up here like, I, you could add like Hebrews 4.15, 1 Peter 2.22, 1 John 3.5. These are giant passages. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians 5.21. You can add to that list. Therefore, based on this, as a result, the also nature is identified with our, our, the lust of our flesh. The old sin nature, we get, we get Adam's sin, as a he, member of the human race, we get to Adam's sin, and we get a sin nature package. That's a package deal. All of this enters as passed down. You get it at physical birth, and you keep it to, that's why it's in your mortal body. Mortal body. You get it at birth, you have it till death. Except for Adam's sin. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, it is removed. 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin is removed. And the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside your mortal body so that it can control the old sin nature. Because you're going to have the old sin nature, you got it at birth, you're going to have it till death. That's the internal enemy of the Christian life, is your sin nature. <coughs> Galatians 5.16, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's the sin nature. These two are at war within the Christian life, struggling on who's going to sit on the throne. Who's going to be the master? You allow which one to set. Now, the Holy Spirit can't leave your life, agreed? He cannot leave your body, John 14.16, he can't leave. He's there forever. Jesus said it. I know. Look, you have to hear this stuff a while. I know. Therefore, do not let sin, Paul says in, in Romans 6, 12, our study today, therefore do not let sin, nature, reign, be in charge, be the master in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. When you obey its lust and gratify that, that's sin. Person, that's personal sin. That's individual sin. What do I have to do? I have to confess it. What's it do? It gets me back to spirituality. It gets me back to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. You need to read 2 Corinthians 4.11. I put it on your paper. Point three, positional sanctification. We've talked about the three the three divisions or the three classifications of sanctification. Okay? Positional sanctification refers, transfers the one believing the gospel of, of salvation in Christ from a legal, a legal judicial position in Adam, 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin upon the human race. You, you need to really understand that is removed by the mercy of God. Is removed by the mercy of God. I mean, the justice of God looks at it. The justice of God looks at it, and you, you are condemned. Look, alien, here's what you are. Alienated, blind, cursed, condemned, uh, dead, spiritually dead, in spiritual darkness, at enmity. You're the natural man. You're a sinner. Not because you sin, you're a sinner, because you're in, in Adam. You're a sinner. None of that can change. You're unrighteous. You're ungodly. You're, you're under the wrath of God. None of that can be changed apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The moment you believe the gospel, all 13 judicious, because they're, they're judicial. In Adam... In Adam all die. In Christ all are made alive. That's judicial. And the mercy of God puts Christ on the cross, accepts his sacrifice for our sin, and when we believe it, we are justified. 
to be the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, it's a gift of the grace of God. It's a marvelous concept that Paul is teaching us. Thirteen are removed and 37 are given. There's more than that. I just quit at 50. I thought 50 would be enough to stagger you out the door. <laughs> I just consider those the big ones. Point number four. See, Adam's sin we call imputed sin. The old sin nature we call inherent sin. And personal sin we call individual sin in theology. As a result of positional sanctification, point four. As a result of positional sanctification, the old sin nature no longer holds a master-slave position of authority. The moment you accept the gospel of Christ, every, every aspect of your life was under, the minist- was, was under the sin nature because the, only the old sin nature, old sin nature set on the authority of your throne. That's where selfishness and self-centeredness comes from in the human race. Now you get saved. The moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit sat on there on that throne. He's the captain of the ship. The first time you committed a sin, he was no longer on that throne. He was still in your life, but you had chosen to let the sin nature reign. Agreed? Well, of course, he said, you got to stop doing that. He put, it in the abstain- he put it in the present imperative, which is a standing command. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Go to the Holy Spirit who lives there. and say, Listen, it's called your inner dialogue. You know about your inner dialogue? Your inner dialogue. Stop talking to yourself so much and start talking to the Lord. Listen, the guy you're talking to is going to get you in a bunch of trouble. He's a guy who's gotten you in trouble your whole life. Why would you go to him for advice? <laughs> Can I help you out? Ooh, just go get the gun. That would be his advice. Go over and have a meeting with him. That would be his advice. Not without your Bible, because you need. If you're going to go over to his house, let's talk, let's lead him into Christ. No, we're going to duke it out. Nah, I wouldn't do that. You're not going to come out. And go down. I can think I can take him. You'll never be able to take him. The Lord wouldn't let you take him. He wants to get you to take you to the house to get him saved. I mean, duke him out. What are you talking about? Duke him out. Grab the Bible and say, let's see who can find the most passages. Don't go to the flesh all the time. Don't go to the flesh. Go to the spirit. It's inner dialogue. As soon as you start talking to yourself about something and you get a little irritated, what you should do? Stop that. Stop it right there. Go to the Holy Spirit. Third member of the Godhead is in your body. He's there to give you all the advice, to give you all the counsel, to give you all the power to perform. The power to perform. Not willpower, it's Holy Spirit power, people. Well, you need to read that. You need to read Romans 6 6. When you get down there, I, I mentioned three that's. I put them in bold print. You ought to pay attention. That's one, two, and three. That's point one, point two, point three in Paul's thinking. Knowing this, that our old man. Our old man, paleos, where you get paleology from. Anthropos, where you get um, mankind or anthropology from, the study of anthropology, the study of man. <laughs> that's interesting. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That's retroactive position of truth, isn't it? Crucified with him? <laughs> yeah. That it should be our, not tour. I'm not on a tour. That's, that T should not be there. That our body of sin, that's the old sin, that's the package of the old sin, that's the package of Adam's sin that produces, as well as Adam's sin, the old sin nature. That's a package deal. That body of sin 
Let's see, well, let me find my place again. That, 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 and that. That our body of sin, the Adam's sin, old sin nature, that's that package, and then personal sin or individual sin is volitional. I'm just telling you how it is. Let's see. That the body of sin might be done away with, the third that, that we should no longer be slaves. See, an unbeliever is slave to his flesh. He's got no other option. He's only, there's only one person that rules his life, his flesh, his sin nature. And when we get saved, the sin nature is still in his life because he's still alive, but the Holy Spirit sits on the throne. The first time you commit a sin to gratify your flesh, the old sin nature is still in your life because you're still alive, Right? That, but now he's on the throne and the Holy Spirit cannot leave, so he's still in your life, but he's not on the throne. It's, so who do you want on the throne of your life? I know. I know. Stay. With, prom, I promise you, stay with me one year. I will get all this settled out in your soul. I will get it all settled out in your soul. See, that's why when you, like your first John 1, 9, you confess your personal sin, that's what gets the sin nature off the throne and puts the Holy Spirit on it. When you confess your sin, when you confess, your first John 1, 9, when you confess your sin, it automatically takes off, puts the Holy, the Holy Spirit on, it takes the old sin nature off. Because it's about the cross of Christ. The sin issue was taken care of with the cross of Christ. This time you come back to the cross for sanctification, not salvation. Well, I don't know. One of my children told me, said, Dad, you might be, you might be offering these people more than you could deliver. I said, what are you talking about? You said, if you stay with me a year, I'll have all this. And then I got to thinking about that. that I may have just got, I may have just painted myself in a corner. <laughs> yeah, I've been 47 years doing this. And, um, yeah, I may have, I may have said, I, I said, well, I don't think I can tell them if you stay with me five years. <laughs> I just, if I, if I could get him to stay a year, I'd be happy, honey. At the moment of believing the gospel of grace, salvation, the church age believer is free. Oh, you ought to circle that word. The church age believer, that's the cab. <laughs> the church age believer is free from both. You can see how lazy I am. The, the Adam's original sin and the sin nature is set free from both of them. What a wonderful thing. Set free. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him, were baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That Galatians 5 over there, that Galatians 5, 1, 13 and 25, it, it says, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Live in your freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. This is what Paul's talking about. It's for freedom that Christ set you free. Don't put yourself back. Every time you, every time you put the old sin nature back in it for some selfish reason, you put the sin nature, well, I'm mad and I'm going to be mad for at least an hour now. Well, why do you do that? The fact that the Holy Spirit went like, what are you doing taking me off the throne of your life and putting me down like that? Well, it takes me about an hour to get over it. Well, it should take you about a minute. Confess your sin and get back with the Holy Spirit. What do you mean an hour? Because I know people that have been mad for years. Oh, are you kidding me? How do you live with that? Not easy, I can tell you. You, you want to read Galatians 5, 1, 13 to 25? That's dynamite. Position of truth belongs to the carnal believer as well as the spiritual believer. 
it belongs to the baby believer as well as the immature believer as well as the mature super grace believer because it is based on the grace of God and not upon man's religious works or moral goodness. It's based on the work of Christ, not the work of man. Well, I'm out of time, so you can read the rest for today. Look, I know I give you a, a lot of information. I do it because you've got to study during the week, week this stuff. You can't just come in and sit down and osmose it. You've got to study it and build upon the principles that are important here. I give you all these scriptures, and I try to develop it into a system of point one, point two, point three, to kind of walk you in it and out. So, look, we're, we're a Bible-teaching church. I make no apologies for it. That's what my calling is. That's what my calling is. And I just want you to know this stuff. It's important to your personal life. Your relationship with the Lord is really important. Uh, let me, uh, before I close uh, today, let me remind you that um, we've got baptismal service here uh, Wednesday night, uh, is 6 or 5.30? 6. 6 o'clock. <sighs> oh. Well, the last time it was like it broke the ice. Broke the ice out there. And we got, uh, Willie says, five, five young women uh, to baptize. That's wonderful. And so we're excited about that. So. Uh, if you've, you've got a free time at 6 o'clock, come on out and see a good old-fashioned baptismal service. You'll enjoy it and, and uh, to support these young women who have come into their faith in the gospel of Christ. So we're excited about that. Well, let us stand. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then Rick is going to close us out. We're, we're, so, we're so thankful for the freedom that we have under the American flag as a church without censorship except what we place on ourselves. We're so thankful for that. Father, we do thank you for America. We thank you, Father, for our leadership. We pray that you would uh, encourage our hearts with it. Our hearts need to be encouraged. And uh, we're so thankful that you're on the throne of all the affairs of man. Well, I don't know how we'd get by one day to the other without it. Uh, the price of everything. But we know you're faithful. And if necessary, we, you'll just take one of your cows on the, on the many hills and uh, supply our needs. And we thank you for that. Thank you for these that have come with us today, Father, to study the word. I pray the Holy Spirit would encourage their hearts to study to grow into the great ministry the Holy Spirit wants from our life in the divine plan of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Rick? pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.